another electrifying night in the Loud House. Syracuse University's JMA Wireless Dome, the on-campus site for multi-sporting events in Syracuse, New York. But all that glitters is also old. You see, today we're going back to the beginning. Back to the grainy good old days. And back to the golden glory days. To Archbold Stadium and the Manly Fieldhouse. Come on in, it's almost tip time. Find your seat and dust off those memories. Yeah, we're headed once upon a yesterday where they don't play the games anymore. People have a tendency, and this I think is a fault. They only remember the, the present. They forget all about the, the past. The beanie, the 1959 beanie, I happened to see at a garage sale, which was, uh, I thought, the 1959 team, and I go, okay. It kind of just meshed together with everything else. With the everything band. else is Jim Degnall's massive collection of Syracuse University sports memorabilia. Your ticket to the past. This is from Baker Field, Syracuse, Columbia, back in the 30s. This is my oldest ticket, it's 1922. Well, that's Colgate. And now that you're in the stadium, you can't tell the players without a program. I pick up a program here and there and it just kind of it blossomed from there. Uh, and I liked the preservation of the programs, keeping them. And these things get forgotten by, uh, I think, later generations, so to speak. Well, I think it's something you can actually hold, touch, and feel. You, you can have somebody tell you things, but if you got an object that you, you revert to, things can all come together. The programs capture not just the game, I think it captures the area, the various uh, things that are going on. Companies that you might have known as a child or a kid growing up, your parents talked about, did business with, and there they are, you know, and, and now they're gone. So. I think it's a, a historical perspective uh, that interests me as much as anything. My father's whole life was uh, around basketball. And it all started right here in downtown Syracuse. Where Captain Dave Brodsky was the point guard on Central High teams that won state championships in 1921 and 22. And playing alongside with Brodsky was Vic Hansen. Who became a lifelong friend of my dad's and a great sports story in Syracuse lore. Upon graduating, the duo took their game to Syracuse University, where they played two years together. At 5'10 and 175 pounds, it was easy to underestimate Hansen, but not for long. He was a prolific scorer during an unprolific era, once scoring 25 of Syracuse's 30 points in a win over Penn. The team played their games in Archbold Gymnasium, where the Orange Cagers frequently filled the 3,200 bleacher seats. The captain of the basketball, football, and baseball teams was a legend in his own time. Vic Hansen's athletic accomplishments were many. He was a three-time All-American in basketball and football and often said that baseball was his favorite sport. Enough so that he played two years in the New York Yankees farm system. It's no surprise that the big news in town in 1928 is when the Yankees optioned Hansen to the Syracuse Stars. Even Lou Gehrig said he was rooting for Vic, calling him a good fellow. But in 1930, at the age of 27, 
Hansen hung up his baseball spikes and returned to Syracuse University as its football coach, a position he held for seven years, posting a 33-21 in five record. Vic Hansen is the only man inducted into both the Naismith Memorial Basketball Hall of Fame and the College Football Hall of Fame. Dave Brodsky's career was equally renowned, becoming known as the father of Syracuse High School basketball. And after he played, he coached at Central High School for 13 years. And during those 13 years, he had 11 city championships and two state championships. Coach Brodsky taught his players not only about winning games, but winning at life. And this is well after he was done coaching and people would say, gee, your, your, your father was such an influence on me. History hides in plain sight. You'd never know that back in 1895, Syracuse University dug up the crops here and created an oval athletic field for their sports teams. But Chancellor James Roscoe Day had big ideas, and university trustee businessman John D. Archbold had big money. His $6 million donation created eight campus buildings, including Archbold Stadium and its adjoining gymnasium. At the time of its 1907 opening, it was one of only three concrete stadiums in the world and was proclaimed the greatest athletic arena in America. And those who attended games here couldn't agree more. It was built like a Roman Colosseum is the way I describe it. Uh, they had temporary seats along the oval and then above that concrete seats that you sat in without a back for most of them. The funny thing is most of the people that were there were rabid fans. Regardless of the weather, people showed up for the game, and whether it was raining or snowing or whatever. I mean, they were there. They didn't miss the game. I remember one game in the snow uh, that Floyd Little just ran wild. They beat the, you know, beat the snot out of UCLA. When you didn't go with your parents, you usually went with some of your boyhood friends and you would sneak in the old Archibald Stadium. The first time I went to Archibald Stadium was in 1955. I went with my dad, Frank Sr. And you come in through the Irving Avenue entrance and they had a fence there. And uh, when you knew what you were doing, you were able to sneak in. <laughs> that was part of the fun. in my blood immediately, instantly. I think I roamed around that in concrete bowl and through the arch and I, I took it all in. But my mother would pack me a hot chocolate and about three or four sandwiches and probably a bag of popcorn or something. I loved the sound, the roar of the crowd made after a touchdown was just deafening and just completely a different sound than what you get in the dome. The camaraderie somehow was different. Everybody was huddled together because it was cold. Uh, it's compared to being in the dome now. It's, it's not the same. They gave you a booklet of four, four games, four football games for $5, but you never got the Colgate game because that was the key game at the end. Well, first of all, people dressed up. Uh, the women were, really, everybody looked dressed up. Now everyone goes like schlumps, right? <laughs> it, the traditions were what stuck with me. The, the cannon after every score and the hundred men and a girl marching band and 
from the tunnel out of the west, the orange men, you know, and the team would come through. I'd never seen anything like it. It was big time. Yeah. It was big time. Some of the players on the football team wore ter tearaway jerseys. Steve Chomazak was about 6'7", 310 pounds. After the game, I'd get attacked by teenagers trying to rip my jersey off. And Larry Zonko was 6'4", and all of 240. I, I never felt so small in my entire life. And then I got one jersey half torn away. We had turkey dinners, and they took three turkey dinners and put one on top of another. And Schwartzwell, the, the coach, said, you better learn to run faster. You better learn to dodge better. Because you're going to have to pay for that, that half of that jersey. I never did pay, but <laughs> he scared me. They had what they call placard cheering. And everybody was given a, a card, uh, about 11 by 14. S supposedly, if you were sitting in the right seat and had the right you know, number, you know, some turned to the orange, some turned to the white, so that it, it formed a letter, but it didn't always work. <laughs> there was always somebody that was out of, you know, I'm not, I didn't want to sit there, I wanted to sit next to my friend. <laughs> the games at Archibald that I remember, they're the most memorable to me uh, when it was cold out because, and, and when I was not real old, maybe five, six, seven years old. My parents would decide how many layers of clothes we had to put on. Meanwhile, it was so cold and we were walking like this. It's like we were taking a trip for two weeks, but we were just going to Archibald for the afternoon. And my mother would give us each an apple, which we could not eat until halftime. <laughs> and my father had this metal thing that I wasn't maybe until a teenager to figure out it was filled with some kind of booze. One time America was very much a segregated society, and collegiate sports was strictly a white man's game. The entrance to the field and locker rooms were closed to men of color. But in 1935, that door slightly opened when Wilmoth Sidat Singh received a basketball scholarship from Syracuse University. As a light-skinned African-American, with the adopted last name of his Indian stepfather, many thought that Singh was Hindu. One day while playing intramural football on the quad, his strong arm and quick feet caught the attention of assistant coach Roy Simmons, who convinced Siddhat Singh to also join the football team, where he became a two-sport sensation. He is best remembered for the Cornell game of 1938, when he rallied Syracuse with three touchdown passes in a six-minute span, defeating Cornell 19-17. But Wilmoth Sidat Singh was not immune to the slings and arrows of Jim Crow. For 1937, he was benched for a game at Maryland because the Southern Segregationist School prohibited African-Americans from playing at Bird Stadium. Even back in Syracuse, exclusion reigned, where the Hotel Syracuse wouldn't serve a black man a drink, and you couldn't even room with your white teammates. Yeah, Wilmoth was a man on the outside. Outside, always looking in. And forget a pro career, the leagues were whitewashed. No colors allowed. So he bounced around the barnstorming circuit a couple of years. Became a DC cop. And finally landed with the Tuskegee Airmen, the only all-black unit of the United States Air Force. Serving a country that had denied him equality. But suddenly, a tragedy. 
1943, Wilmoth dies in a training accident over Lake Huron. But fear not. For many years later, they raised his number high. And now the outside man is finally in on the inside. Autumn 1942 was less than a year after Pearl Harbor. While the Nazi war machine was rolling through Europe, American boys were either getting drafted or enlisting. So anyway, Coach Lou Andreas drew it up. He was fighting a war of attrition. So in order to fill the void, freshmen from the junior varsity were called up for action. With yearlings, Eligible for varsity competition for the first time in almost 30 years, uh, several Cubs are pressing for berths on the Syracuse 42-43 quintet. One of those Cubs was Binghamton's Billy Gaber, who could have easily been a Niagara Purple Eagle, but they unwisely bailed on his recruitment. He plays Niagara twice a year for four years and beat them all four years, uh, twice, eight wins, including this finale. And he was still talking about that when he was 90 years old. Gaber didn't start SU's first seven games, and the team was floundering with a one and six record. And finally, Andreas said, we're not doing that well, let's, let's try putting the freshman in. And by the time that se season was over, he had scored the most points that any SU player had ever scored in a single game. Lou Andreas was one of the great innovators of the game preferring a wide open style of play instead of a regimented set offense. It was a style that Billy flourished in. He was fast as lightning and he was competitive. One of his nicknames was the bullet. But the favorite line I've ever read by a sports writer about my dad was the introduction to an article about him and, and the uh, line was, uh, there was a fierceness about him that was almost scary. And I really think that defines him. He was really competitive. After his freshman year, Billy served his country as a bombardier and lieutenant in the Army Air Corps. This is a one point win. Uh, Syracuse 66, Colgate 65 on February 15th, 1947. After returning to school in 1945, there'd be many more big nights and big numbers for the two-time All-American. He primarily scored in uh, two different ways. One, because of his speed, he got a lot of fast breaks, a lot of fast break layups. He had another uh, nickname called the Blonde Bomber, uh, a lot of long, three-point set shots. In January 1947, a fire destroyed most of Archbold Gymnasium. For the next several years, the team played their home games at the War Memorial, the Jefferson Street Armory, and the State Fair Coliseum. They put out the fire, but Billy was still smoking. He was the first one to score 400 points in a season and the first one to leave Syracuse with 1,000 points for his career. Billy Gaber was the all-time Syracuse scoring leader until Dave Bean broke his record 20 years later. The Bullet was the first Syracuse basketball player to play in the NBA, spending six years with the Syracuse Nationals and becoming an All-Star in 1953. Do you remember Dottie Grover? And who doesn't remember Dorothy Dottie Grover? In the early 50s, the beautiful baton twirly majorette was the halftime highlight at Archibald Stadium. Dottie Grover, I thought, was the absolute most beautiful thing I ever saw. And she was blonde and vivacious, and she twirled a uh, light of baton. She 
She was the leader of the 100 Men and a Girl Band. She uh, was a baton twirler, leader of the band. Sometimes I've seen pictures of her uh, on a white horse twirling a baton in Archibald. She was national sweetheart of Sigma Chi. You know, all eyes on her. You know, I have a feeling a lot of guys were fantasizing about, you know, going on a date with her. When Dottie's marching down the field days were over, she was marching down the aisle with Billy Caber. So they met while, really while they were both celebrities. Uh, uh, one a Syracuse grad, an NBA player, and my mom, you know, talk of the town at SU. And they, they married uh, right after mom graduated in 1953. Dad uh, made Syracuse's all-century team. Uh, These days, Bill Gaber preserves the memory of his parents with objects, uh, scrapbooks, and above all, his heart. I might be prejudiced, but she was just a sweet woman, a, a, a lovable person, and, and uh, you know, I think she was really friendly and, and didn't have an ego at all. It was like this, and you just you just shot a two-handed shot. You didn't shoot with your one hand. Ah, yes, the two-handed set shot. It's been out of the game a long, long time. But back in the early 50s, SU's Mel Besden could really knock him down from the perimeter. Like the night in Archbold, when his record-setting bombs lit up 17th-ranked Niagara for 31 points. And if you followed him, there was a price to pay at the free throw line. Foul shooting, I took great pride in. And I, there was, like at Colgate, I think I made 15 out of 16. And, and I don't know, Penn State, 12 out of 12. Mel marvels at today's athletes. They're in the weight room. We weren't allowed to go in the weight room. If they caught us in the weight room, we'd have to take laps because they didn't want us to ruin our shooting, you know, with getting their arms. That's the way it was then. And dunking was strictly for swimming. You would bend the, the rim and then they would have to stop the game and change the rim. There were no flexible rims. He grew up right down the hill from Syracuse University in the Jewish neighborhood of the 15th Ward. His game progressed from the Cedar Street Jewish Community Center to Central High, out to Manlius Military Academy, and finally Syracuse University, where coach Mark Gooley was delighted to have his 6'2 forward phenom in the lineup. I had a tough coach, but he, he played me in every game. I never missed a game and he, he played me. We had pretty good teams and we weren't great, but we played and we went all over to play. Mel says one of his greatest thrills was performing in Madison Square Garden. And I said, this is wonderful. And then I went to practice and I'm dribbling the ball and all of a sudden there's dead spots all over this court. This is not a very good court, but it was Madison Square Garden. His biggest challenge was always playing Colgate in Hamilton. And the night before, I would never sleep because it was a nightmare. I would come on the court with the team and they'd wave their handkerchiefs, Melvin, Melvin. And then I'd take the ball out of bounds on the side and they would pull the hair on my legs. And then they'd sit in the back of the, of the, of the, uh, of the basket. They had like posts back there. And I'd be taking a foul shot and I'd see the, the basket moving a little back. And what the hell's going on here, you know? I had to overcome that. However, one night the Orange men got their revenge in Hamilton. And the buzzer goes off and we win. And I took the ball and I threw it in the stands and I made a gesture, which I won't describe what it was. I won't describe, and I walked off a happy man. Coach Gooley knew he could always count on Mel in the clutch. Even now, so many years later, a buzzer beater against Cornell still resonates. Mel was trapped on the perimeter, 
and wearing the big red defenders. In desperation, he let the two-hander fly from way, way outside. But the shot was high and wide, and it looked like lights out for the orange, when suddenly... And, I, and all of a sudden, it seemed to me, the ball curved, and it goes in the basket. And I say, what happened? And everybody's jumping, and the buzzer goes off. It was, it was fun. It was always a lot of fun. Yep. Mel Besden just keeps rolling along.